big and go bold, right? I hope every one of you is encouraged by the boldness that Scott Wagner has shown and the leadership that he has shown and the fact that he is willing not simply to promote himself and his plans, but also to really dedicate himself to raising up a new generation of leaders. Well, part of that generation is before us right now, so I want you to continue your spirit of encouragement this morning when you meet our next four. These truly are rising stars in the state legislature. So I want to uh, introduce you to them and then ask each of them to begin by giving you about one minute of their personal background and specifically their race that brought them here. So please welcome Senators Pat Stefano, Camera Bartolotta, and Representatives Kristen Phillips-Hill and Mike Regan. I'll begin right here with Mike and just go down the line. One minute on your background and your race, and then we'll get into some questions about your experience as rising stars in the first few months in the legislature. Good morning, everybody. My morning. name is Mike Regan. I am a retired United States Marshal. I retired in 2011 after 23 years of service. Um, I live in the 92nd District. I'm a rep there. And Scott Perry was my representative before uh, I retired. And when the dominoes kind of fell where Todd Plass decided he was going to seek, uh, or he was not going to seek re-election, and Scott moved on, uh, I saw an opportunity. It was interesting for me because I was not really a, a political guy. I was a law enforcement guy, and I was Hatch Act constrained, so I wasn't even really allowed to be part of the political process. So I went in as kind of a rube, and I think that was a, a good thing for me because I, uh, I brought my old school work ethic to the, uh, to the race. And instead of trying to win the race by talking to lobbyists in Harrisburg, I went out and knocked on 10,000 doors, and uh, I think I won the trust of, of the electorate. So it was, a, it was a kind of a brutal primary. There was five of us. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, I won by, I think, 16 points, uh, put me head-to-head -head against the Democrat, and uh, thankfully, thankfully for me, I'm in a very Republican uh, district, so I think the race was really won, won in the primary. Uh, I live in um, Carroll Township with my lovely wife, Fran, and our four great kids, and um, it's been a remarkable experience so far. I just entered my second term, and uh, I look forward to continuing on. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you for being here this morning, bright and early, and sharing your breakfast with us. I'm, I'm Kristen Hill, and I have the distinct privilege and pleasure of representing the people that live in the 93rd District, which is Southern York County. Um, I replaced State Representative Ron Miller, and um, I was the unintended candidate. I never really intended to run for the legislature. Um, I had a wonderful career as a stay-at-home mom, owned my own business, um, supported my husband's career, and uh, spent a lot of time serving people in our community through various volunteer opportunities at church, at school, and um, in, in some other civic organizations. And uh, I was asked to run for school board. And uh, I, I really, resisted, and, and there were a lot of problems our school district was facing. Um, we weren't happy with the leadership. We weren't happy with the spending. We, we didn't see a correlation between student achievement and, and the money that was being spent, so I decided to run for school board, and um, I went there thinking that, you know, I'm not going to wait for anyone to come riding in, you know, our shining knight on a beautiful stallion to fix our problems. I want to fix our problems here at home. And we, we achieved that. Um, we didn't raise taxes during my tenure as a school board director. But I, I really began to see that there was a correlation between our spending problem and what happened in Harrisburg. So uh, a series of rather unusual events led to the uh, opening of this House seat. And um, I decided, if not me, then who? The gentleman who was running had run previously, I didn't think he had the, the answers or the solutions to, to what we're facing. So um, I, put, I, I put my name on the ballot, and uh, I knocked on many doors, not quite as many as Representative Regan, but 
enough doors to know that um, what I was feeling and what I was sensing, that the people who live in the 93rd district agreed with me. Um, so it's been a, a, a wonderful journey, and um, it's been an incredible pleasure to work with you know, Senators Bartolotta um, with her on the Taxpayer Protection Act, and Senator Stefano, I'm shortly going to introduce a House Companion Bill to one of his, his measures in the Senate, and to uh, work with the York County delegation. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience, and I'm so pleased to be able to be here. Good morning. I'm Pat Stefano, and uh, Scott Wagner, what you said. <laughs> Actually, um, I'm a third generation uh, printing company owner. I come from Fayette County. Uh, I've grown up there, worked my entire life. <laughs> Very good. Um, and I've been involved in the community, and I always you know, said you give back to your community because you're a member of that. And I've been involved with, uh, with the chamber. I was on the government affairs committee, and I've been on several other uh, groups. And, I belong to the NFIB, and I've always watched my leader's votes. But I'm sitting at a Rotary board meeting one day, gentleman sitting next to me, gets a phone call, and he has a funny look on his face, comes back a couple minutes later, and he said, did you ever think about running for office? And I looked at him and said, hell no. <laughs> well, how would I want to do that? But as it later came to be that there was an opportunity here in this 32nd district to enter in a race that I've never thought of before, I've been held by the Democratic Party for 67 years. And I said, well, you know, I, um, I can come and come to the table, I can work hard with some help, I think I can, uh, I could make a difference. And I thought about that and I said, you know, uh, why should I let somebody else represent me when I could do the job myself? And I wanted to bring my values, my small business values, and into leadership, and I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll, I know how to work hard, and everybody came together. We did work hard. We went out over the community, and the result is what you see here today, and I'm just so glad to be here and be able to bring my family and small business values to the Senate. I'm Cameron Bartolotta, um, the State Senator for District 46, and I have to thank our wonderful, very shy and retiring wallflower, Scott Wagner, for helping me. <laughs> you really got to come out of your shell a little bit, Scott. Uh, for all of his incredible help, um, because we do really think alike. And you know what? It's, it's wonderful to see um, since, since the election, but uh, actually just a few months before that, that we, we were seeing all these Republicans come out of the closet. It was a wonderful thing. If you remember there for several years, um, you really kind of had to hide the fact that you're a Republican conservative. Uh, it was almost like a little secret handshake that we did. Um, it's wonderful to actually be able to, to speak in front of a huge, huge crowds that get bigger all the time of people who are very, very proud to be Republican and have conservative values. It's wonderful. Um, the reason I got into the race, uh, about two and a half years ago I was approached, I was asked if I wanted to run for state, for a state rep. Um, and that would have only given me a few weeks uh, to, to even get all the petition signatures and just hit the ground running. Um, I like to do things uh, that, that I know a lot about. I like to research and I like to study. And it was, when they approached me, it was only less than two years after my husband had passed away. My son was still in high school. I said, no, no, no. They came back and said, well, you know, we'd, we'd like you to run for state senate in two years. Um, and I knew who my opponent was. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Uh, so it gave me two years to really study and learn and speak to people and really listen to people. I knocked on almost 9,000 doors and spoke to tens of thousands of other people at every function, festival, fair that you could possibly imagine. You know how that goes. Um, and the message I was getting from all of those people was a different message from the professionals, the experts in Harrisburg. Southwestern Pennsylvania is a different animal. Um, it's regist it, registration is two to one Democrats. Uh, my seat had been held since 1946 by Democrats. And until election night, I didn't even know that it had never, ever been held by a woman. So that, that, was, that was an interesting little factoid. Um, but what really, really kicked me into gear was about two years ago when my daughter, Devin, came home from Ohio University on spring break. And she said, oh, mom, some of my sorority sisters are going on mission trips. 
So, wow, that's great. Where are they going? Guatemala, you know, Mexico. She said, no, Manesson, which is the town across the river from my house. <laughs> so they're sending missionaries to a town that actually originally had been in my district, but now is no longer. But it represents, it's, it really is so similar to so many of these other little small river towns, old coal towns that now the population has dwindled down to nothing. Um, the, the demographic is geriatric, nearly, um, and economically depressed. And I just thought, yeah, this is ridiculous. Um, somebody has to do something. And when you look around enough and say, isn't someone going to do something, pretty soon your finger goes like this. And that's exactly what happened to me. So that's when I threw my hat in the ring and I just kicked it into high gear because somebody has to do something. Um, and there's, there's a, my tiny little corner of the, the state is what I lovingly call the basement. You know, strong and sturdy, but you just never put a lot of money into it. Uh, so it's, it's time for a change. It's time to really pay attention to our small little towns, which are the heart and the soul of not just Pennsylvania, but the whole country. Tight little cities that are really urban and really trendy, that's not normal. Monongahela, Denora, Charleroi, Manesson. That's normal, and we have to protect it and defend it, and that's why I decided to run. I think you're properly characterized as rising stars for the very values that you just uh, summarized in, in talking about your personal stories and your races. And uh, before we get into Q&A, I think our room here would like to express our appreciation to you for your boldness in truly fulfilling the founders' dreams of what a citizen legislator are supposed to be all about. So let's begin with that. <laughs> However, rising stars can be threatening. Sometimes they threaten the establishment. Talk to us about how you've dealt with the balance between being a freshman member in a body where seniority carries so much weight. How do you boldly establish yourself and yet not get to the point where it's almost counterproductive? How do you balance that? Or maybe you don't balance that. Maybe you think that, that pleasing uh, your, the senior leadership is not your function. Your function is simply to be powerful advocate for the set of issues that got you elected. Let's begin with Mike. Well, I mean, I think I had a little bit of an advantage uh, coming from a, a long career in federal law enforcement. I was immediately assigned to the Judiciary Committee, uh, so I was kind of thrust into a world I was very familiar with. And I think because of my background, I had instant credibility with many of the leaders and the chairman of, of, the, of the committee, which made it nice for me because I think I actually wrote my first bill after I was elected before I was sworn in. I mean, it was right after the horrible shootings at Newtown, and had a real background in institutional security and facility security. So I wrote a bill to try to protect our, our kids, and that I submitted that, I think, you know, it was right after we were sworn in. Uh, so I think I kind of hit the ground running on other issues. I mean, I, I certainly was not an expert on many of the issues, many of the policies that we were talking about as, as a freshman. So I, I really sat back on those and just listened and learned and watched. You know, there's a, within the House, and I'm sure within the Senate, within the whole legislative body, there is this kind of politics behind the politics, uh, you know, who's who and what's what, and how do you, what's the best path to get things done. I think it takes a while for a freshman to realize how that works. Uh, so I just kind of hunkered down a little bit and looked and listened and, uh, you know, I think after probably, you know, several months to a year, you start to feel comfortable in how things should go. And I kind of branched out. But, you know, for the first maybe six months, I was pretty much just dialing in on what I knew uh, before, I, before I branched out. But it's, uh, it's been a very rewarding experience, I have to say. It, it's, it's, it's a little bit daunting, but uh, I think it's worked out well. Thanks, Mike. Kristen, how about you? I think it's an art. It's, it's really understanding people. Um, there certainly are some, some people who will say to you that you're a freshman and, and you need to know your place and you need to be quiet. And, um, and I think you have to be respectful, but I think that 
you have been sent there to represent 65,000 people, and they're being represented. They are just entitled to that representation as the person who is being represented by someone who's been there for 25, 26 years. So um, it's sort of an art of being deferential and respectful, yet firm because you are there to represent the views and values and, and do the will of the people back home. So um, much like uh, Mike, you know, I, I come out of the education community. I'm very familiar with what's driving our spending problems, and I've really spent a lot of time focused on that, in large part because that's also the biggest problem facing our district. Um, so that has been helpful. And certainly, um, I come from a county that has an incredible delegation where every single one of my colleagues has really been supportive, helpful, um, help me navigate sort of the, these treacherous waters that you find yourself in when you arrive at the Capitol. Um, our senator, all of our House members have, have really been helpful. And I felt like it's really given me sort of that edge up on the average freshman. So it's, uh, thank you. And, and thank you to all the members of the York County delegation. They have really been wonderful. And, and, and my hope, and what I try to do every day is just have one small accomplishment, know that I've done something well for someone back home, and then I feel as if I've, I've had success. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Sure. Senator Pat. <laughs> when I was running and, and going door to door, talking to different people, and they, a lot of people would ask me the same question. Well, you're just one person. Can, what can one person do? And I said, well, there's something unique. And that, when they talk about timing being right, the timing was just perfect all the way around, whether it be my daughter coming in as the fourth generation and taking over for me, whether it was uh, where, where my life was when these phone calls came, and, or the call that came from West Virginia to help me decide. It, it, it's just a whole plethora of things. But what I told everybody is when I was running, there was something special happening. There was more than just me that was coming into the Senate or in the Senate that aligned with my principles. So I felt like I was coming into a group that believed in the same way I did. So I'm not a force of one, I'm a force of many. And we all think alike. And what was really great, it was coming into the Senate leadership who believed like I believed. And um, I didn't feel like a freshman coming in, even though I am, I had this really steep learning curve. And I'm, believe me, I'm only halfway up it. But I'm learning, but something that I, all those years of uh, being in business, being a part of communities and uh, boards, I learned how to network, and I've done that for 30-some years of networking. So I've developed my skills, so that's immediately what I did, was go in, let's meet the leaders, who are the movers and the shakers, and let's build these connections. So I'm not gonna be sitting back in the back being quiet. I wanna be part of everything that's going on. So um, I don't feel like a freshman at all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Very, my experience has been very similar to Pat's, and uh, what I've always done um, with any project that's ever been before me was you just hit the ground running, and you know you, you learn as much as you can. You you talk to people who have have done that before and walked that same path before, and you model after them. You find out what what they learned, what missteps did they take. Um, that increases your learning curve tremendously. You surround your, yourself with excellent people. I, right off the bat, I hired probably the best chief of staff I could have, and that's Katrina Anderson. <laughs> She's phenomenal. Um, you know, and then from there, you know, you take the advice of people who know, people who are experts in, in their field, and you just keep going, and you don't slow down. You know, I, if, if you're on a swim team and you're at a race, you know, I don't care if it's your first one, or, or not, and there's someone who's on the blocks next to you who might have had a hundred before you. You don't let them get a tenth of a second in front of you. You give it all you've got the whole, the whole way down the lane. And that's exactly how I feel that, that, that you know, me and my team have, have, have done things. Um, and it really is a team. You know, I don't think any senator can do things really on their own. There's too much to learn. There's too much to know. Uh, and and you, you really need to get out there and just do the absolute best job you possibly can every single day. Uh, you know, don't, you don't offend people by thinking you know more than they do. You ask them. You ask them for their advice. You, you, you listen to them. You watch how things are done, and you, you catch up, and you keep up. 
So let me just follow up and we'll go to in the reverse order. How do you decide how to make an impact as a freshman in an institution where you're often told that your first term is all about learning the ropes and understanding the complexities and how bills are written and mm -hmm. those people down in the basement that take perfectly simple ideas and convert them into virtually inscrutable language, all of that sort of stuff. How do you blow that stuff aside and make an impact as a freshman? Well, I was married to a lawyer for 22 years. So. <laughs> yeah, you, you learn the whole lawyer speak and you just have to go, okay, you know, this sentence is useless and you get down to what, what starts out as seven pages to, okay, it's a paragraph and a half, now I get it. Uh, you know, you find people who can really, you know, interpret that for you uh, and, and move on. Uh, but uh, it's, it's just, uh, as, as a freshman, um, as you said, you just do the very best you can and, uh, you know, learn from people who know um, and learn how to read the bills. And, and one of the best things I did, and when they came to me and asked me to run, and I said, no, I need time, um, those two years that I took, really learning everything I could possibly learn, talking to people who were, were doing you know, what, what I wanted to do and doing a really good job at it. The people who really don't have such a great reputation, you don't really talk to them about how to do things. Uh, you, know, you learn what not to do as well. Uh, so, so it was that two years for me really was an intensive graduate program, if you will, on, on being a state senator. So that prepared me really, really well. So studying helps? Asking, talking, listening is a big thing. I always tell people you've got two ears and one mouth and use them exactly in that you know, uh, percentage. Um, but you talk to people and you listen to people and you know what their issues are, what their needs are, what their concerns are, and then you find a way to, to help them out. Senator Stefano, how, would you, how do you plan to make an impact as a freshman? Well, as, uh, as you know, when you go into something completely different that you've never done before and you don't know too much. And as any leader will tell you, you surround yourself with people who do. So I immediately hit the ground running and built a wonderful team that knows the inside and outs of everything here in the Senate. And that was what's important to me, is they can help filter and feed me information that I need to help make the decision. And we work together as a team. Uh, the one thing I always, in that, even all the way through business, I, I heard this. People will say, well, that's the way we've done it. I don't want to ever hear that. I don't want to hear what they've done before. That's the past. We're going to do something different this time. So um, just like Cameron said, my grandmother always used to say this too. You know, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Use them in proportion. And um, so I'm always listening to see what the issues are. Then I go out to the experts, my uh, staff, and say, this is what we need to do. And there, we're always working together as a team. And... Uh, crafting whatever we need to do to represent our area the best. Well, I have limited my term. I believe in term limits. I said I will not serve longer than five terms, 10 years. So one of the things that I like about that is that I don't feel like I have the time to sit back and just wait for things to happen. So it's a lot of learning um, every night. Uh, to the point where my husband is probably ready to send me to the guest room because I'm on that iPad researching issues. I serve on the health committee. I haven't had a lot of experience in the healthcare community. So I am constantly reading and learning and, and it's also making relationships, relationships with people who you feel share your values and, and the values of your people back home that you can rely on to give you good information and good direction on things that you're not an expert in. It's also about building a great staff. I am so blessed and fortunate to have an incredible group of people who, have, who are working for me. I, I have a retired naval officer who has a PhD, owned his own business, moved here to be near his grandchildren, and he is an incredible mind and so very helpful whenever I have to dig into issues deeply. Um, and I think you have to, it's, it's almost like triage. You have to take what you've learned from your people back home about what their greatest issues and their greatest problems are, and you have to prioritize them based on what is going to help them the most. And, and I think that really helps keep you focused. Um, you're, you're almost like a racehorse. You need to have blinders on and head to the finish line. 
Well, Colin, as you know, I am starting my second term, so I am way more experienced right. and worldly than my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> Senior on this stage. <laughs> Uh, you know, what I was really surprised, not really surprised, but I was pleasantly surprised, was how good the, the staff of the committee, the committee staff and the, and the Legislative Research Bureau are when you're drawing, when trying to write a bill, uh, they'll come and sit with you and listen to everything. And literally, very quickly, a couple of days, you'll get a draft. Uh, and you can go through and, and line out what you like, or you know, keep what you like and line out what you don't like. And, uh, and they're so helpful. It, it, it's just really amazing to me. I remember. When I was writing that school security bill, um, you know, very, very scrutinized language went into that bill, and I sat with uh, the ED of the Education Committee for hours on end. And uh, you know, he was a guy who was very experienced and uh, was uh, with Senator Picola in the Education Committee in the Senate for many years. And I knew he was probably getting tired of hearing me talk, but couldn't have been more patient and more welcoming uh, to a freshman member when I was writing that bill. So there is really, really good staff. And then, as everyone else said, our, our district staff and our office staff are all very, very helpful. It makes it, it, makes it easy. Uh, you know, it's really not rock and science. It's just bearing down, finding something you believe in, something that's, I think, good, will benefit the people of Pennsylvania, benefit your constituents, and just uh, press forward. Um, I think you're, un, you're unlimited in what you can do and what you can achieve if you just buckle down and work. So it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. What kind, you, you each spoke about your races and how you connected with your constituents, knocked on as many as 10,000 doors. Now that you're in office, what's the most effective way of staying in touch with your constituents? In particular, what kind of constituent communication do you find most useful? Is it best if a constituent visits you in your office, in your district office, sends you a fax, sends you an email, send, uh, calls on a, on a pending bill, face-to-face uh, -face at a rally? Which, which are the most effective means? And particularly for folks who are involved in grassroots organizations, as many of the people here at the PLC are, what is the best way for somebody who represents not just him or herself as an individual, but an entire a group of people, what's the most effective communication that really helps you? Um, actually, email is the very, very best thing, um, in particular so that we can disseminate it to the right other staffers that are experts in that particular field. Um, I honestly, I have gotten so many constituent issues and things as Facebook messages. Um, I have a huge presence on, on Facebook. Uh, I have my own private, well, it's not private anymore, but it was my own personal account that I, I turned into, you know, just kind of open to the public, really. But this, my Senate page, I've got over almost 1,700 likes on my Senate page, and we just started that just a few months back. Um, Twitter, uh, you know, uh, social media. It, on my web, website, people can click on and get the e-newsletters. They can contact me through that email. Um, but really, email is the best way, and we actually respond in kind. If someone emails the office, we respond via email. If they call the office, we respond with a phone call. If they write a handwritten note, we hand write a note back to them um, and then request that they communicate via email because it's faster, um, it's easier to disseminate that information, and it's easier, easier to respond immediately. And in my office, when we get a phone call or an email request or something for a meeting or an event or appearance or anything like that, my staff knows respond to that request within 24 hours. And not to say, oh, this is the date we've set up for you to come and meet you know, with, with camera, but we've, we've seen your request, we're working on it, um, we will get back to you as soon as we have a date available. But that's my rule, within 24 hours that someone contacts my office, they are contacted back. In our little conference call that we had prior to this, just to get organized for mm -hmm. today's panel, uh, you mentioned what you just cited, which was that you respond in the form in which you were contacted, mm -hmm. email to email, phone to phone, handwritten note to handwritten note. I had never heard that from anybody before as a specific uh, methodology for contacting. Uh, we all know that there are people who are email people, and there are other people who are text people, mm -hmm. and other people who are phone people. 
And sometimes you contact the phone person by email and you get no response whatsoever. Or if you do, the response is, call me about this. Right. I think your idea of responding in the same ma manner in which you were contacted is absolutely brilliant. And in my experience, I never heard of anyone who was quite as sort of uh, uh, decided and almost formulaic in the way you've done that. And I just want to salute you for that. Well, I, think, I think that's great. How about you, Senator Stefano? What's the best way for people to contact you? What do you find most useful? Well, I have to say that we uh, come from the same school because we respond the same way, you know, the same channels. If it's a mail, it goes back by mail, email, return email, phone call, same thing. Well, I won't reiterate I, it. But, but I, I, I salute you as well, then. <laughs> we, we all come from the same school. But um, the, uh, the best so far that I've seen, because we've, we have a wonderful staff, and they're fielding a lot of these calls and emails, is uh, email, I can see trends right away, what direction we're going to go. So I, my personal belief is email is one of the best ways we have lots of people reviewing those emails, and they all get gathered back to me to review. Um, but we won't stop any other way. Um, ask my children after church, they'll tell you. Um, that's, I, I, I do face-to-face -face right after church, so people come out uh, on the steps, and they say, Dad, why are we always the last one? I say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm the senator now, and then we are going to talk to, the, to these people, and, um, and that's where I get all the issues, and my wife will never send me to the grocery store anymore. <laughs> but I don't mind. This is where we interface. I, I still go to all the festivals. I go to as many events as I possibly can. Um, I know I'm not running for office now, I'm in office, but that's where I hear, that's where I listen and learn. So again, I'll go back, the email is one of my most preferred, but wherever you can find me, by all means, I'll be glad to talk. And then if you want to schedule a meeting with our office, please do, and then uh, we'll get you on the queue, and we are glad to hear the issues. Uh, we do exactly the same thing that um, my Senate colleagues do as well. And this is what I would say to you. I really don't care how you get in touch with me. Please just get in touch with me. I can't do this job unless I know what the people I represent are feeling, needing, concerned about. Please just get in touch with me. And my husband never sends me to the grocery store anymore <laughs> because sending me to the grocery store for, you know, orange juice is a two and a half hour exactly. adventure. So, so yes. Well, I have an, maybe an interesting story. It's a story. You can let me know if it's interesting or not. But uh, when I was uh, probably, I don't know, maybe six months ago, I got a Facebook message from a former colleague of mine who's a Drug Enforcement Administration agent. He's actually assigned in Afghanistan. And right around that same time, there was an armed robber in Upper Allen Township who was uh, committing these violent armed robberies wearing a mask. And uh, you know, I think everyone was really concerned that this individual was going to kill somebody during one of these robberies. So he sent me a message on Facebook from Af Afghanistan because he was looking on PenLive from Af Afghanistan and said, you know, you really ought to consider writing a bill that increases the sentences for those who commit an armed robbery wearing a mask because it complicates the police effort, it traumatizes the victims. So, you know, that's a great idea. So that bill passed last week. By the way, it passed through the House last week. I was very happy about that. But it's amazing how you get these little things from people. But you also get around 200 emails a day. At least I do. I'm sure senators get more. They have much, many more constituents. And it's almost impossible to sit and to answer them by yourself. So I have a staffer that really deals with the email. And she lets me know when there's something I need to respond to. And um, I like calling people. Uh, I think it kind of catches them off guard, especially people who are upset with me about something. I pick up the phone and, and, and call them, and uh, you know, it seems to be somewhat disarming uh, to talk to them in, in person. Or if someone sends me, and you get these two, you get like 16 part questions in an email, I'll, uh, I'll call them and say, hey, why don't you come in so we can sit and, and, and flush these issues out uh, one at a time. So, I mean, I think it's what people want from the representative is just that <coughs> availability. You know, People talk about reducing the size of the legislature, and I think that's a good idea, and I voted for that bill, but I think that's the one thing that might be left out is the fact that we have, people want your time. People want you to respond to them. People want it in a fairly timely manner, and I think that would probably cut down a little bit, but it's one of the great part of the job, parts of the jobs for me is just sitting in my office on the couch talking to constituents, and uh, I think it's a way you really build trust 
and uh, you know, develop relationships, let's carry on. Okay, we have just a little over two minutes left. Can I ask each of you for 30 seconds on the thing that you have learned that you did not expect to learn, the greatest surprise or the greatest lesson that you've had in your first term, or in your case, Mike, your first two terms? Oh, there's there's so much. Uh, how how wonderfully helpful people in Harrisburg have been from the very very first day, very welcoming, very very helpful, um, ready to share any any help that that I could possibly ask for. Um, the the really wonderful thing that I've learned is, I know it's going to sound really weird, how much power you have when you call and say hello. This is Senator Gabriel Bartolotta. Like just. Suddenly, the doors open and things happen, <laughs> and you're like, really? Wow. Uh, you know, things that I've been able to accomplish for my district in this very, very short time, uh, like just, just attending a PennDOT meeting in my tiny little neighboring town of Denora, who literally, they have no grocery store, no gas station, and three of their banks closed in a six-month period. McDonald's failed in this town. <laughs> Uh, and PennDOT was going to close off an on-ramp and off-ramp for the only way for these people to get in and out of town, you know, without taking, you know, twice the time. And that would have jeopardized emergency services and everything else. Uh, you know, so I went to this meeting and, you know, I'm sitting there and PennDOT's like, oh, well, we'll do anything that we can and we're going to leave that open and we'll do, you know, we'll work with you and we'll make sure that we don't close this up. And I just thought, thank goodness. You know, that, that someone's actually taking a look at an issue and, you know, that would otherwise literally be a nail in a coffin to this town. And just, just by being there and noticing it and paying attention and participating in the discussion, you know, this town now has, has a way for fire trucks and ambulances and, and buses to get through. Good for you. Thank you. I guess the, 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 the one thing that I can take away from coming in to, as the Senate and not expecting was the information flow on, and, and I said, close your ears. It's, uh, it's like drinking from the fire hose. Mm -hmm. So much information is coming at you, so much to read, so much to learn, and it's also very important. And we all work together to handle that. That is one of the biggest things I learned. And the other thing I'm learning now is who do you go to? Who do you talk to? Who don't you go to? Yeah. Those are the biggest <laughs> things. Where are the traps? Where are the landmines? So you know where to step and where not to step. That, that's the biggest thing that I've learned. And I have to echo your same sentiments as um, now when you pick up the phone and make a phone call, all of a sudden the door's open. <laughs> and it was, it's, it's important. I, and I'll echo a same PennDOT issue where in my township, Bullskin Township, there was ice built up on the road. And for all winter long, people were worried about head-on collisions as they were trying to go around this ice. And no one would do anything about it. They called the office and boom, half an hour later, PennDOT was there and de-iced the uh, area and fixed the water. So I well, said, <clears throat> I like being, bringing that. You don't by any way. chance have any potholes in your district. <laughs> <laughs> no, none whatsoever. I post pictures of them on Facebook. That's it. That's great. <laughs> That's <laughs> terrific. We're just a bit over time, so I'm going to ask you to be concise. I will, I will be very concise. I, I think there's this sentiment that uh, People in this institution don't work very hard. It must be really nice to just work three days a week in Harrisburg. And, and I think that's, it. if I could dispel the myth, these are some of the hardest working people I have ever worked with. Um, it's transitioning to being a legislator from being a full-time parent. Being a full-time parent's a 24-hour job. Being a legislator has become a 24-hour job. Um, and, and I know that we've talked about this amongst ourselves in, in York County. Um, I, it's not unusual to put 80 plus hours in a week in this right. job, whether it's being in your office, being with people, doing your research. Um, we are always on the job. Just to amplify that a little bit, I, <laughs> my first year in office, uh, I heard from a couple of different people along the way, how are you enjoying your part-time job? <laughs> yeah. I thought, my God. <laughs> my God, so the second year, I, I had my staff keep track of my hours, and we did the math after the end of my second year, and I made $4.58 per hour. <laughs> so way below the minimum wage. So I think that's one of the things that's, uh, and I think I was a little dubious about, uh, you know, about that going in. I didn't realize. And the other thing is, you know, I, at least in our Republican caucus, I can say that there's a really tremendous amount of really dedicated individuals. And you see a group of guys huddled in the back of the house and you think they might be talking about the Steelers game, but they're actually talking about pension reform. So I think we're lucky, uh, and I think they're maybe under-heralded for the, 
for the dedication and the work they do. Well, as an Eagles fan, I'm glad to hear they're not talking about the Steelers game. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. <laughs> See, that, now we can divide the room. <laughs> quite, quite seriously, I hope we are all encouraged by the quality of representation that these newly elected members of the General Assembly provide. Thank you for sharing your time, experience, and passion with us this morning. Thank you.